Book two of The Republic opens following a heated exchange between Socrates and Thrasymachus in book one. The sophist Thrasymachus had been pressed by Socrates to define justice, and Thrasymachus answered with the definition that justice is nothing but the advantage of the stronger. In other words, he took the position that what we call justice is really nothing but a social contract serving the ideological interests of the ruling class. This, of course, has become a very widespread idea of justice due to the influence of such 19th century ideology critics as Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche and their 20th century followers in the Frankfurt School and the New Left, today often known as critical theory. Socrates managed to trip Thrasymachus up dialectically, unsurprisingly. However, Plato very realistically portrays the effect of such dialectical victories. They may succeed in embarrassing the loser and making him uncomfortable, but they tend not to convince him. Indeed, it seems that no one is convinced by the result in Book One. Hence, the first book of the Republic has often been considered as a kind of prolegoma to the main argument of the work. Some scholars have even suggested that it may have originated as an independent standalone dialogue. It may have rep roughly represented the position of Socrates, which Plato was dissatisfied with, and so he's trying to supersede that position in the Republic. The second book begins with Socrates' friend Glaucon, frankly admitting that he is dissatisfied with the outcome of the dialogue with Thrasymachus in Book 1. But the attitude of Glaucon, in contrast with Thrasymachus, is instructive. Thrasymachus was hostile and belligerent towards Socrates throughout. Clearly, his heart was hardened, to use a biblical phrase, and no matter what Socrates argued, he was not prepared to agree or concede. He knows what he knows, and that's that. Like a stubborn old man who's held the same opinions his whole adult life and is incapable of changing them now. There's really no point in arguing with such a person. Except maybe if you want to embarrass them and shut them up. They're incapable of being educated because they don't want to be educated. Hence, in their case, philosophy is pearls before swine. This realism about human psychology is implicitly acknowledged by Plato, which might be part of the point of beginning again in the second book after dealing with the kind of character that Thrasymachus represents. Because Glaucon represents a new beginning with a new spirit. Glaucon, by contrast with Thrasymachus, is the kind of person that philosophy is made for. He sincerely wants to be educated. He wants to believe what Socrates says in praise of justice. The trouble is he's having trouble believing him because he's of a divided mind. So the care of the soul that philosophy can possibly provide in his case is to heal that divided mind. We get a sense of his uh, perspective on page 255. This is around uh, 358b. Glaucon is speaking. For I want to hear what justice and injustice are, and what power each has when it is just by itself in the soul. I want to leave out of account the wages and the consequences of each of them. So if you agree, I will renew the argument of Thrasymachus. First, I will state what sort of thing people consider justice to be, and what its origins are. Second, I will argue that all who practice it do so unwillingly, as something compulsory, not as something good. Third, I will argue that they have good reason to act as they do, for the life of the unjust person is, they say, much better than that of the just one. So Glaucon is going to be uh, arguing here as the devil's advocate, expressing the opinions of the majority of the um, hoi polloi of the masses, what people generally think about justice, what sort of things they say justice is, 
um, their view that people are just only unwillingly. Um, and that's because that naturally speaking, the life of the unjust person is better than the life of the just one. And so he, he will be expressing this point of view. But he qualifies this by saying, it isn't Socrates that I believe any of this myself. I am perplexed indeed, and my ears are deafened listening to the Symmachus and countless others. But I have yet to hear anyone defend justice in the way I want as being better than injustice. I want to hear it praised just by itself. And I think that I am most likely to learn this from you. That is why I'm going to speak at length in praise of the unjust life. By doing so, I will be showing you the way I want to hear you denouncing injustice and praising justice. So Glaucon and his brother Adamantus is going to go on to present a very forceful argument for the view of justice as a mere means to an end and, and as something that is not valuable in the soul for its own sake, for itself. This is really a model of the way to uh, be able to get inside the head of your opponent's position, because this is not the position that Glaucon actually holds himself. He makes that clear. But he's able to very forcefully articulate the position of someone that he is actually intellectually opposed to. So this provides us with a good lesson for how to be able to charitably reconstruct your opponent's position, as well as a forceful challenge, a standing challenge to those who would praise justice as something that's valuable for itself, for what it can do in the soul by itself. Glaucon had begun, though, a little bit earlier by noting that, that people generally believe there are three kinds of goods. And um, I've listed these here, the three kinds of goods. This is right at the beginning, the opening of book two. He says that there are three, three kinds of goods that people generally talk about. There are things that are good for their own sake alone and not for their consequences. Enjoyments, he says, uh, various types of harmless pleasures. You might think of, you know, games and things like that. Um, that sort of thing, harmless amusements, things that are good just for their own sake, but they, they don't have any good consequences necessarily. They don't have any consequences necessarily. They're just good for their own sake, just harmless amusements, harmless enjoyments. That's the first category. The second category is things that are good for their own sake as well as for the sake of the consequences. So this would include things like seeing, he says, and being healthy, so I, we value being able to see for its own sake because it's, it's good in itself, pleasant in itself to be able to see. Similarly with being healthy, those things are good for their own sake, but they're also good for their consequences. Because I can see, I can do many things that I couldn't do if I couldn't see, such as read a book or appreciate a sunset or, um, you know, drive um, an automobile and so forth. Similarly with being healthy, obviously there are things that you can do when you're healthy that you can't do when you're unhealthy. So it's good both for its own sake and for the sake of the consequences. And third, there are things that are good only for their consequences, like a medical treatment, getting a root canal. That's something that's not good for its own sake, but only good for the sake of its consequences. So those are the three kinds of good. And the question is which of these three types is justice? And uh, what Glaucon says is that the many believe that justice is of the third type here, that it's good only for its consequences. It's not good in itself. But he wants to say that justice is actually uh, of this second type here, that it's good both for its own sake and, as well as for good consequences that it has. It's good to have justice in the soul for its own sake. And of course, it's also going to be good for the sake of the city and so on to, um, to have justice in the souls of the citizens. But it's, it's, it's good just for the citizen to have justice in the soul for its own sake as well. And this opposes the view of the many who hold that justice is only of this third type that being just is like having a root canal or getting a medical treatment. And the reason for um, the opinion of the majority on this is they, 
They think that it would be good to be able to do injustice with impunity. Basically, you get whatever you want, whenever you want. You wouldn't have to worry about whose toes you stepped on in getting what you want. But, of course, the problem is that if everyone thought that way, you would also be vulnerable to other people acting and, and, so to speak, stepping on your toes. So as wonderful as it would be to be able to do injustice with impunity, it would be equally terrible to suffer injustice. So he says, um, 255 in the right-hand column. Now listen to what I was going to discuss first, what justice is like and what its origins are. People say, you see, that to do injustice is naturally good and to suffer injustice bad. But the badness of suffering it far exceeds the goodness of doing it. Hence, those who have done and suffered injustice and who have tasted both, the ones who lack the power to do it and avoid suffering it, decide that it is profitable to come to an agreement with each other, neither to do injustice nor to suffer it. As a result, they begin to make laws and covenants, and what the law commands they call lawful and just. That, they say, is the origin and very being of justice. It is in between the best and the worst. The best is to do injustice without paying the penalty. The worst is to suffer it without being able to take revenge. Justice is in the middle between these two extremes. People love it, not because it is a good thing, but because they are too weak to do injustice with impunity. Someone who has the power to do it, however, someone who is truly a man, would not make an agreement with anyone, neither to do injustice nor to suffer it. For him, that would be insanity. That is the nature of justice, according to the argument, Socrates, and those are its natural origins. So the position here, I think, is, is reasonably clear. It's only through a kind of weakness. And it's a humiliating sort of weakness because it means that, you know, you're not, you're not man enough to be able to just force your will on others. You have to enter into agreement. You have to enter into compromises uh, in order to avoid being victimized. But the, the person who was truly strong, was truly manly enough, would be able to just force his will on others and wouldn't have anything to do with justice. So there's, there, if that's the case, there's clearly nothing intrinsically good about justice. It's merely a kind of compromise. It represents a kind of humiliating um, uh, agreement that one has to enter into against one's own wishes, really, because one is too weak to really pursue one's wishes in the way that a true man would. So uh, this is the way that justice is being described. Now, how can we determine whether the majority are correct in their opinion? Glaucon proposes a thought experiment. Imagine that both the just and the unjust would have the freedom to do whatever they like. Wouldn't the just behave exactly as the unjust do? That's the view. Who could resist the temptation to behave unjustly if you could do it with impunity? You had some absolute guarantee that you could get away with it. And the story that illustrates the reason that most people think justice is only an expediency is the famous tale of the ring of Gyges, which is recounted here in the left-hand column of page 256. We won't need to read it here, go into all the details, um, all the literary nuances of this tale. But the, the basic, the, the gist of it is that um, someone comes across a ring of power. Essentially, this is where um, J.R.L. Tolkien got the idea of the ring in The Lord of the Rings. Um, comes across this ring, and the ring is able to turn you invisible. And so um, Plato says, essentially, if you had this ring, would you really bother to follow the dictates of justice? Um, so this is the way that Gaukon puts it. Let's suppose then that there were two such rings, one worn by the just person, the other by the unjust. Now, no one, it seems, would be so incorruptible that he would stay on the path of justice 
or bring himself to keep away from other people's possessions and not touch them, when he could take whatever he wanted from the marketplace with impunity, go into people's houses and have sex with anyone he wished, kill or release from prison anyone he wished, and do all the other things that would make him like a god among humans. And in so behaving, he would do no differently than the unjust person but both would pursue the same course. So we see the logic here. Uh, in order to show that justice is really valued only for its expediency, only for the fact that people are too afraid of committing unjust acts because of what will happen to them if they face punishment for those acts, Gokhan suggests, uh, perform the following thought experiment. Imagine you had the ring of Gyges. Would you really continue to uh, toe the line to be a just person if you if you had that power. And if you're honest with yourself, he suggests here, you wouldn't. You realize that um, this is not the case. No one believes justice to be a good thing when it is kept private, since whenever either person thinks he can do injustice with impunity, he does it. Indeed, all men believe that injustice is far more profitable themselves than justice. This is the idea. If you could really do it with impunity, would you would you do it? Some people might say, well, no, I wouldn't because, you know, I'm worried that, that God would punish me because God would still be watching. So you might want to think of the thought experiment in this way. Imagine that just for a moment, you could be invisible to God. God wouldn't know what you had done. Really, God wouldn't know. He seriously wouldn't know. Um, would you, what would you do then under those circumstances? If you, if you could have a whole year in which somehow you're given a guarantee that God is not going to count it against you. God is not going to see what you do during that year. Would you continue to be the good and just and moral person that you are today? And this is our first discussion question. What do you think you would do if you possessed the ring of Gyges? Do you trust yourself not to commit injustices that are unthinkable to you now. If you believe you would refrain from committing unjust acts, on what basis do you believe this? So this is the first discussion question. What do you think you would do if you possessed the Ring of Gyges? Do you trust yourself not to commit injustices that are unthinkable to you now? If you believe you would, in fact, refrain from committing unjust acts, on what basis do you believe this? Galkland thinks that the majority position looks reasonable because everyone believes that the unjust man is happier than the just man. Being able to be the unjust man, he almost suggests, is a kind of fantasy um, in the way that people fantasize about the lives, lifestyles of the rich and famous. If I could just be that way, you know, how happy I would be. Similarly, if I could do whatever I wanted and I didn't have to be, be concerned about morality or justice or any of that, hooey, uh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't I be happy then? And we can see why people think this way, Glaucon thinks, if we imagine the perfect cases of each, the perfectly just man versus the perfectly unjust. So this is kind of a second thought experiment. Imagine the perfectly just man, imagine the perfectly unjust man. How, how do their lives look? How do their lives compare? And he suggests that in order to really carry through this experiment, we have to imagine, this is the 256 on the right-hand column towards the bottom, around 3621 A and B. We have to imagine that the unjust man has the greatest reputation for justice. Because the unjust man, the, the, the height of injustice, the, the extremity of injustice, is to commit all kinds of bad things, to do all kinds of unjust actions, but have the reputation that you definitely do not deserve, have the opposite reputation from the one you deserve. That's very, very, very unjust. If you think of justice as roughly getting what you deserve, then for an unjust person, for a person who does all kinds of injustice, all kinds of bad, evil things, to have the reputation of being a just man that is the height of injustice. That is 
and of course we're familiar with this from the movies and so on, Game of Thrones or whatever it may be. In those situations, the truly the most evil characters are, are the ones who are not only evil, but who are who also have the reputation or the public image of being good. So that's what he says. If the, this is going to be the perfectly unjust man, the perfectly unjust man, if, if you really get perfectly unjust, has to have also this degree of injustice that he's regarded as being just. He's got this reputation that he doesn't deserve. That that's more unjust than just being an unjust man who everyone knows is an unjust man and therefore probably hates. Right? This no. This has to be a person who's loved for his justice, who gets all kinds of accolades for being how just he is. But then secretly, he's very unjust. That's the perfectly unjust man. And conversely, the perfectly just man has to have the reputation of being completely unjust. Why? Because the perfectly just man is the one who does justice just for its own sake and not at all for the sake of some rewards that he's going to get. And so we have to ensure in our thought experiment that this person isn't, isn't doing just actions just because he wants to get paid through a good reputation or through honors or through some other kind of re rewards. And so how do we assure that? Well, in our thought experiment, we'll say, imagine that this person has a reputation for being the most unjust. Again, theme of many sort of Hollywood movies, you have like um, and, and Marvel superheroes and so on, Spider-Man who's viewed as being a villain and so forth, this kind of thing. Um, uh, Harrison Ford, the, the fugitive, the just man who's viewed as being unjust. That's, that's the idea. And this, of course, as Hollywood is well aware, increases our admiration for their justice, is that they're, they're continuing to be just even though their reputation is, is different from that. So what's going to happen then if you put these two uh, side by side? Uh, at the top of 257, he says, speaking of the, the perfectly just man, the midway through the top paragraph in the right-hand column there, he says, we must strip him of everything except justice and make his situation the opposite of the unjust persons. Though he does no injustice, he must have the greatest reputation for it so that he may be tested with regard to justice by seeing whether or not he can withstand a bad reputation and its consequences. Let him stay like that unchanged until he is dead but all his life believed to be unjust. And he goes on to say in the bottom of the column there, the just person in such circumstances will be whipped, stretched on a rack, chained, blinded with a red hot iron, and at the end when he has suffered every sort of bad thing, he will be impaled and will realize then that one should not want to be just, but to be believed to be just. Um... What, by contrast, is the situation of the unjust man, right? So the just man has ended up like, you know, like Ned Stark in Game of Thrones or whatever, ends up impaled. Um, what happens to the just man? The one who commits all the worst injustices you can imagine, but has managed through his clever stratagems to ensure that he is viewed by the public at large as being just. What happens to him? Well, he rules in the city because of his reputation for justice. Next, he marries into any family he wishes, gives his children in marriage to anyone he wishes, has contracts and partnerships with anyone he wants. And besides benefiting himself in all these ways, he profits because he is not disgusted by doing injustice. In any contest, public or private, he is the winner and does better than his enemies. And by doing better than them, he becomes wealthy, benefits his friends and harms his enemies. This is one of the kind of the stock definitions of justice, by the way, um, among the Greeks, to be able to benefit your friends and harm your enemies. Uh, and he makes inadequate sacrifices to the gods and sets up magnificent offerings to them and takes much better care of the gods, indeed of the human beings he favors than of the just person. So we may reasonably um, expect that the gods in turn will love him more than the just person. That is why they say, Socrates, that gods and humans provide a better life for the unjust person than for the just one. The just person isn't going to be punished by the gods because he's able to essentially buy them off with sacrifices and offerings and so on. Um, okay. Now, at this point, 
after Glaucon has made his case that it seems that no reasonable person could possibly claim that justice alone is sufficient for happiness and that the just man is necessarily happier than the unjust. It seems to be quite the opposite. At this point, Glaucon's brother Adamantus takes over and adds to the argument the point that not even fathers and the poets praise justice for its own sake, but only for the sake of good reputation. That's the way the fathers praise justice or teach teach their sons that you should be just because you want to have a good reputation. That's the incentive they offer. And the poets say, well, there, there'll be rewards and punishments in the afterlife. But Adamantus notes that people sometimes say that there's punishment in the afterlife for the unjust. Of course, we're familiar with this from, our, from the Christian tradition, although it was to some extent derived from Plato and the Greeks. But it, it's uncertain whether there's punishment in the afterlife for the unjust, as we're well aware. Is there a hell? Is there punishment for, you know, is Adolf Hitler burning in hell right now? Do you know? That's essentially what Adamantus is, is suggesting here. We, you know, we don't really know after all. Um, and moreover, these same poets who tell us that this is the way it is also suggests that the gods can be propitiated, that they can be brought off. Thus, the very people, uh, bought off rather than brought off, not brought off, bought off. So the, the very people who warn us about punishment for injustice in the afterlife also are the same ones who tell us that the gods can be bought off, can be bribed. And the same sort of thing here. You know, you think of um, the almost cliche that the prisoner on death row has a, a kind of last minute conversion and becomes a born again Christian. And now all his sins, you know, he was a serial killer for 20 years or whatever, but he becomes a born again Christian and now all his sins are forgiven. Or he converts to Catholicism and he, he you know, receives the sacrament of reconciliation and all of his sins are absolved and he becomes clean and so forth. Uh, so, it's, so the same kind of idea, you know, the same people who tell us that we need to worry about hell also tell us, well, there's a way to get out. All you have to do is become born again. Um, all you have to do is, you know, confess your sins and be sincerely sorry and you'll be forgiven. You know, so if that's the case, then why shouldn't we believe that the unjust um, can get get away with it, essentially? Um, if a serial killer can get away with it just becoming a, just by becoming a born again Christian, um, Speaking for his brother as well, Adamantus lays out his request for Socrates in the face of all of these worries. It's on uh, page 260 of our text, starting at <coughs> 366e. No one has ever adequately described what each, each being justice and injustice what each does for itself through its own power by its presence in the soul of the person who possesses it, even if it remains hidden from gods or humans. No one, whether in poetry or private discussions, has adequately argued that injustice is the greatest evil a soul can have in it. Injustice is the greatest evil a soul can have in it. In other words, injustice is bad just by being present in the soul regardless of what consequences it has. It, it trumps all of those consequences that it might have. So yeah, the, the unjust person might be able to, um, as Glaucon had said, might be able to rule the city and marry his children into whatever family he wants, etc., etc. But the evil of having that injustice in his soul would trump all of those benefits. That's the idea. And the person who possesses it, even for remains from God's human, injustice is the greatest evil a soul can have in it, and justice the greatest good. So even the person who ends up being tortured and impaled would still possess the greatest good because he's got justice in his soul. This is the argument he wants to hear. So continuing in the middle of the next paragraph. So do not merely demonstrate to us by argument that justice is stronger than injustice, but tell us what, what each one itself does because of itself to someone who possesses it, 
that makes the one bad and the other good. Again, in the facing column there, a little bit farther up, but on the right-hand column, he puts this a different way. So do not merely demonstrate to us by argument that justice is stronger than injustice, but show what effect each one itself has because of itself on the person who has it. The one for good, the other for bad, whether it remains hidden from gods and human beings or not. So what's this contrast between demonstrate to us, but not just by an argument? In other words, he's saying, don't just show us some kind of abstract argument based on some kind of conceptual analysis. Really what he's asking for here is a kind of psychology, a kind of account of what's going on in the soul of the just person, as if there were doors to the soul or windows that we could open and look into and see what's really going on in there. What's going on in the soul of the just person? What's going on in the soul of the unjust person? So we can see what's going on in there and, the, and thereby make it clear to us how the just person is benefited by having justice in his soul and the unjust person is harmed by having injustice in his soul. That's the, the task that Socrates is set. Okay, so the method of investigation then is proposed uh, on page 261 in our text. This is um, 268, or it was rather 368D. He says, uh, I think we should adopt the method of, this is Socrates now speaking, I, I think we should adopt the method of investigation that we would use if lacking keen eyesight we were told to identify small letters from a distance and then notice that the same letters existed elsewhere in a larger size and on a larger surface. We would consider it a godsend, I think, to be allowed to identify the larger ones first and then to examine the smaller ones and see whether they are really the same. So, I mean, imagine that, you know, this, this mug had a logo, some kind of logo on it, as most mugs like this do. Um, and there was one that looked just like this, but it was, it was way off in the distance. You know, it was like 100 yards away from me. And someone asked me, what is that? What kind of a mug is that? What does that say? You know, is that uh, some kind of uh, University of New Mexico mug? Is this a, you know, New Mexico United Soccer Club mug? What kind of a mug is that over there? And I said, you know, I just, I can't see. And then I noticed that there's one that appears to be the same as it, but it's, it's right here in front of me. And I said, oh, okay, I can see. This is, uh, you know. University of New Mexico mug or whatever, because I can see it. The, the same letters are larger on this one that's close to me than the one that's far away. That's the, the point he's making. So the method then is is the following. He's assuming that justice is a property of both the single individual and of cities. Justice is a property both of the single individual and of cities. But a city is larger than a man, and thus its justice should be more visible. City, obviously, larger than a man, so its justice should be more visible. If we perform the thought experiment, then, of imagining a perfectly just city, constructing one in our imaginations, we can spot justice as it emerges there. We perform the thought experiment of trying to imagine a perfectly just city constructing one in our imaginations, or as, as uh, Plato will later say in words, our, our city of words, he says, that we're constructing through words. If we do that, we can spot justice as it emerges in this imaginary city or this city of words. And since justice is the supreme virtue of cities, that is, of states, of societies, we would say today, if we try to imagine the best city we should expect that it will be the most just city possible. So, again, that's the, the method that we're imagining. Justice is a property both of the single individual and of cities. The city is larger than a man, and thus its justice should be more visible. If we perform a thought experiment of imagining a perfectly just city, constructing one in our imaginations, we can spot justice as it emerges there. Since justice is the supreme virtue of cities, if we try our best to imagine the best city, we should expect that it will be the most just city possible. So 
so obviously this is a pretty convoluted argument, but it's got a rationale behind it. We were talking about the justice in the soul and the goodness of the justice in the soul. Essentially, the question, why be moral, is one of the ways in which this has been translated in the tradition. Why be moral? Gaukon's challenge. Why should I be moral? But now we're taking a detour on this principle that the justice in the individual is like the justice in the city, but the justice in the city is easier to see because it's larger, bigger, like the bigger letters on my mug, then we take this detour essentially into political philosophy. And we're constructing then a kind of political utopia, the perfect city. And we're going to try to, try to discover where is the justice in this perfect city on the assumption that the perfect city will be the most just city possible. So how, how should we start with the construction of this imaginary perfect city? The basic assumption guiding this construction is that the best city will be the one that performs the function of a city best. It's important enough point it's worth writing down. The best city is the one that performs the function this is the Greek word, the ergon. We think of uh, ergonomics, the science of functionality, right? Performs the function of a city best. This is a crucial assumption from which we begin. And it obviously raises the question, what is the function of a city? And another way to frame the same question is to say, well, why are there cities at all? Why cities rather than no cities? Why cities rather than just scattered individuals and families and clans maybe and so on? So this is what he describes in page 261, middle of the right-hand column. A city comes to exist, I believe, because none of us is individually self-sufficient but each has many needs he cannot satisfy. Because we have many needs and because one of us calls on another out of one need and on a third out of a different need, we gather many into a single settlement as partners and helpers. And we call such a shared settlement a city. So what's the function of a city? It's just because we're not self-sufficient creatures, we have needs, the city serves to fulfill or satisfy our needs. It meets our needs. Cities exist to meet our needs, to meet the needs of individuals. So that's the basic point about the function of a city. A city is an instrument for meeting the needs of individuals. So this then suggests a point for establishing the origin of a city in our imagination, our imaginary construction, we can ask what will a city be like by asking what our needs are. So we start with the basic needs and we ask how can they be best met? And so the basic needs, of course, as we're all aware are our food, clothing and shelter so these needs are going to be met by those who can provide food, farmers, those who can provide um, clothing, tailors and shoemakers and the like, and uh, those who can provide shelter, carpenters and so on. But the more important point is that they're provided by people who perform these specific roles who occupy those specific trades, not by people who are jacks of all trades. Everyone isn't to be his own farmer, or his own carpenter, or his own tailor, or his own shoemaker. Of course, that might be the case if you're a pioneer living on the frontier in the 19th century American West or something like that. Um, but it's not, it's not going to be the case in the, in the ideal city. In the ideal city, there's going to be a division of labor. Uh, so he asked the question, this is a left-hand column of 262, around 269E. Well then, should each of them contribute his own work for the common use of all? I mean, 
Should a farmer, although he's only one person, provide food for four people and spend quadruple the time and labor to provide food to be shared by them all? Or should he not be concerned about everyone else? Should he pursue one quarter of the food and one quarter of the time for himself alone? Should he spend the other three quarters providing a house, a cloak, and shoes? Should he save himself the bother of sharing with other people and mind his own business on his own? So what's the answer he's going to give? Well, a couple of considerations come into play. And the first is, he says, we are not all born alike. On the contrary, each of us differs somewhat in nature from the others, one being suited to one job, another to another. So different people have different talents. That's one consideration. Different talents. And the second is, that a person does better work if he practices just one task. The reason for this being that if you're able to concentrate your attention on just one task, you can get better at it and improve it. And you're not distracted by other things. You can spend all your time just perfecting your one craft. So because of difference in talents and because of the fact that practice makes perfect, we end up with the principle of the division of labor. So that kind of the logic of it kind of works this way. The city is going to be governed by the division of labor because of the different talents. Not everyone is good at farming. Not everyone is good at Carpentry. So we're going to have a division of labor so that people's different talents can be exploited to their to the full. And this way, in this way, the city will be more productive. Likewise, practice makes perfect. The products of the city will be have a higher quality if people are able to practice just one craft and get really good at it, rather than having to be a jack of all trades, master of none. So that's where we end up with the principle of division of labor. And this is a very important principle because the division, of, the division of labor is going to necessitate the expansion of the city as the city is required to be able to accommodate different roles, different specializations in the city as each one does what they're best suited for. So specialization through the division of labor drives the need to expand the city. So we start with the bare necessities, food, clothing, shelter. Thus, we need farmers, tailors, and shoemakers, and carpenters. But the farmers are going, to need, are going to need plows. They're going to need harnesses for their oxen and horses and so on. The tailors and shoemakers, of course, are going to need various tools um, for, you know, templates and scissors and needles and, you know, anachronistically, we could say sewing machines and so forth. They're going to need various tools for their work. And carpenters, of course, are going to need hammers and saws and nails and so on. So are they supposed to make all those things themselves? Well, that would violate our principle of division of labor. They're farmers to concentrate on farming. Shoemakers are to concentrate on shoemaking, not on making tools. So we need a class of various types of tool makers. They're going to specialize in making various types of tools, like blacksmiths and so on, harness makers, metal workers. In addition, we can assume that we're not necessarily going to have everything we need in the immediate environment of our city. For example, it may be that we need metal, but we lack the ore for the metal. And so we need to import. And this is going to drive the need to have trade and markets that will further drive the need to expand the city. So if we're going to have have imports, we have to have importers, special people who devote themselves, specialize in importing things. We're probably going to need to have sailors. Of course, this is Greece, right? So a lot of the trade is going to be across the sea. We're going to need sailors to be able to sail ships to Asia Minor or Italy or these places, Africa, and bring back imports. And of course, that implicates a whole range of additional specializations, shipmakers, 
the various specialists and the various as the rope makers, the specialists in the various aspects of the ship, uh, as well as those who specialize in being sailors. And then when the imports come in, we need to have merchants. We need to have wholesalers and retailers uh, to be able to deal with this. We need to have shopkeepers to deal with the um, exchange. We'll also need currency for exchange, meaning the need for money changers, some kind of financial system. So the city expands in this way um, as the need for various specializations expands. That's the logic of this construction. He throws in there, there will also be a need for servants and laborers for various miscellaneous tasks. So to free up the, um, for example, a, a money changer may uh, need to have someone to be able to, um, you know, haul things for him. Maybe boxes uh, full of gold or whatever. He's not strong enough to do it. So you need to have laborers like that who are just day laborers who can come in and perform various miscellaneous tasks. So, so far, Plato has been assuming only a city with the bare necessities. However, there, there will naturally arise a desire for more than the bare necessities. And this is kind of a crucial turn that the city takes. Um, this is at, uh, let's see, 372. This is page around 360, uh, 263, rather. He imagines this sort of, we naturally think of it as, as a Spartan city because Plato is, in fact, uh, is no, has, was known to have been inspired by the way that the Spartans live, and this, the, the noble simplicity of the Spartan way of life. Yeah, Socrates described this on 263. Let's, so he's, at this point, kind of a, Stopping point after these basic necessities have been constructed. First, then, let's see what sort of life people will lead who have been provided for in this way. They will make food, wine, clothes, and shoes, won't they? And they will build themselves houses. In the summer, they will mostly work naked and barefoot. And in the winter, they will wear clothing, adequate clothing and shoes. For nourishment, they will provide themselves with barley meal and wheat flour, which they will knead and bake into noble cakes and loaves and serve up on a reed or on clean leaves. No, no need for porcelain dishes and silverware. You serve, serve up your barley cake on a, on a clean leaf. They will recline on couches strewn with yew and myrtles. Your couch is just going to pile up some leaves and branches and so forth. That's your couch. And feast with their children, drink their wine. They do have wine. He had mentioned, I don't believe he mentioned winemakers. So they have wine. Of course, he's, he's Greek, so you've got to have wine. It's just assumed to be a necessity. And in fact, of course, since probably potable water wasn't a given, it was assumed that wine was the, the way they would receive their hydration. And crowned with wheat wreaths him the gods. They will enjoy having sex with each other, but, but they will produce no more children than their resources allow, lest they fall into either poverty or war. So they'll apparently engage in uh, natural family planning, the, the, the rhythm method, to avoid uh, overpopulation. Then Glaucon says, hey, wait a minute, Socrates, it seems you make your people feast without any relishes. Socrates says, oh, I was forgetting that. But yeah, they'll have relishes. They'll have salt and olives and cheese. So we'll probably have to have cheesemakers. It's kind of a specialization. They will boil roots and vegetables the way they boil them in the country. We will give them desserts too, I imagine, consisting of figs, chickpeas, and beans. So you're, you're no birthday cake, but you get to have beans for dessert. And they will roast myrtles and acorns before the fire and drink in moderation so they will live in peace and good health and die at a ripe old age and pass on a similar life to their children. And Glaucon's shaking his head saying, no way, Socrates. This life is, is only fit for pigs. We need to have some luxuries in this life. We need to have some enjoyments. So the, the, in that way, the desire for luxuries arise. Glaucon insists on what is conventional. They should have proper couches, not just lying in a pile of leaves. 
They should dine at tables and have relishes and desserts, incense, perfumes, prostitutes, and pastries. I guess the, the big four of luxuries, incense, perfumes, prostitutes, and pastries. So Plato clearly has reservations about whether the perfect city would have luxuries at all. He suggests that the perfect city is the one that is this kind of noble simplicity. Uh, and here, no doubt, there's an inspiration for uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau when he heard stories coming back of the Native Americans in the New World living in life closer to what Plato is describing here. Is this, this is, as he says, the noble savage, which wasn't um, a derogatory term in his mind, but the idea of someone who is savage here just meaning someone who, who lives the, the life of simplicity, the life of, of a kind of pure, simple, natural life that isn't corrupted by all these dirty luxuries. That was Rousseau's attitude. We see it anticipated here by Plato. Interestingly, he suggests that the desire for luxuries is the cause of war. Uh, because on the principle of the division of labor here, now you need to have all kinds of people who aren't really contributing to the necessities of the city. So you have, you know, the, the farmers are farming the land to be, of course, they're, they're farming more than they, they can eat to be able to pay for the, for example, the money changers. And you're like, the money changers, well, I guess it's kind of a necessary evil. But these money changers, you know, they're not providing for the, the, the food that they, the, they put into their belly. They're just relying on the fact that the city needs them so that they, have, they can have money to be able to buy food. The farmers are off making their food. Well, now in addition to these useless people um, who have sort of a use, the money changers, you have people like the perfumers, <laughs> right? Those who are making the perfumes, those who are mixing the incense. Um, you have the prostitutes. You have the, the pastry chefs. And all kinds of other people making luxuries, people making, you know, um, handmade furniture that is more ornate and unnecessarily complex and so forth. So you have all these other people. And he says, well, okay, so, um, and then plus he says people are going to demand actors, choral dancers, theatrical productions, all, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to need more meat producing animals, as we know. Uh, it, causes, it takes more farmland to be able to pr produce the feed and so on to keep pigs and things like this. So we got, we've got to have more farmland. And the result, Socrates says, is, well, we're, we're going to run out of land if we have a city like this. If we have a city that that's needs all these luxuries, we're going to run out of land. So what are we going to do? How are we going to maintain our city? Well, obviously, there's only one option. Uh, we've got to take some of our neighbor's land. And of course, if our neighbors think the way we're thinking, they're, th they're looking over at our land that we've got thinking, hey, maybe we, we should take some of their land so that we can have these luxuries. And then you see where this is all leading. It's going to be the cause of war. Socrates says, we've now found the origin of war. This is uh, 373C, E rather, 373E, the origin of war. It comes from those same factors, the occurrence of which is the source of the greatest evil for cities and individuals in them. The factors he's thinking of here is the, the need for these luxuries. This is a second discussion question. Is Plato, is Plato correct in suggesting that the root cause of warfare is the desire for luxuries? Could humans eradicate warfare from the face of the earth if they just restricted themselves to necessities and swore off luxuries? Why or why not? What makes something a luxury anyway? How do we draw the line between necessities and luxuries? What alternative cause of war might there be besides the desire for luxuries? So this is the second discussion question. Is Plato correct in suggesting that the root cause of warfare is the desire for luxuries? Could humans eradicate warfare from the face of the earth if they just restricted themselves to necessities and swore off luxuries? Why or why not? What well, makes something a luxury anyway? You know, is the, is the computer you're, you're looking at, is that a luxury or a necessity uh, in the time of COVID? Think about that kind of thing. Right? What well, makes something into a luxury anyway? How do we draw the line between necessities and luxuries? What alternative cause of war might there be besides the desire for luxuries? 
Okay, well, the possibility of war means the possibility of being attacked. And the possibility of being attacked requires that the city have guardians, defenders, protectors. So at this point, Plato's account of the city turns to one of its main subjects, the education of the guardians. This will be a crucial class in the city. The guardians are those individuals who will be specialists in warfare. So it's clear that um, Plato thinks that you need to have a standing army, kind of prof the kind of professional army that uh, we have in the United States, not a, just a citizen militia or something like that. For the same principle, on the same principle, one needs to have specialists in farming, specialists in shipbuilding, and so on, because there are different talents, and practice makes perfect. And of course, the talents that the um, warrior class have are going to be very particular. It's, it's crucial that they have those talents so that the army doesn't get defeated. So obviously, there are going to be various physical characteristics. He mentioned some uh, keen senses, speed, strength, courage, spiritedness, spirit, you know, think here of team spirit. Uh, you want people who are aggressive, who want to win. As um, General Patton famously said, America loves a winner and will not tolerate a loser. That kind of attitude, that's spiritedness. He says, um, so uh, Socrates compares these guardians to a noble hound or a guard dog. And so they have these natural physical and psychological characteristics. But also like a dog, they need to be both high spirited and gentle at the same time. Uh, because, of course, we don't want them to become tyrants. And, you know, to become like uh, Nazis and uh, or the Gestapo and turn their uh, aggressiveness and spiritedness. And spiritedness also goes along with the idea of, of anger being, you know, um, brutal. We don't want them to be like that towards the citizens. And the, the way that we're going to prevent this from happening, he says, is we want them to really be like noble hounds who are gentle as they, this is a, um, page 266 in our text, left-hand column, gentle as they can be to those they are familiar with and know, but the opposite to those they, who they don't know. And this means that they have to value knowledge. Love of, they have to have a love of learning and, and education. We're getting close here very much to the sort of ideal that you see if one were to apply to one of the uh, military service academies um, in the United States and most countries, the idea of the sound mind and the sound body. You want the officer who is also a gentleman, the officer and a gentleman who is educated, who is not just a um, Conan the Barbarian, but who is also uh, someone who has a liberal education. And this is going to require... Um, a very particular type of education, namely musical training for the soul and physical training for the body. But first, let's just summarize here these characteristics of the guardians, the initial characteristics he mentions. So they're going to be specialists in warfare. They need to have keen senses, speed, strength, courage, spiritedness. But they need to be gentle towards the citizens, and that is going to be ensured by having a love of learning and education. So those are the characteristics of the guardians right there. Okay. Now the conventional Greek belief of the time was that education comprised two parts, musical training for the soul and physical training for the body.
And especially, of course, this one is going to regard us, be regarded by us as, as a bit odd and uh, foreign, unfamiliar. But music here, this idea of music uh, translates the Greek musike. which literally means what is of the music. This is where we get our word music from the Greek musike, which is the, those things that are of the, mu the muses. So the muses, you can Google them if you're not already familiar with them. These are the, the goddesses who are known for inspiring various branches of poetry in particular, which are quite broad. For us, they would include things like uh, religious education and, and history. Um, so epic, lyric, tragic, comic, sacred, pastoral, love, poetry, all of the, all of the different branches of poetry. So literature, there includes the subjects we would, we would group under literature, you know, the subject matter of English, history, as well as dance and music in our usual sense of the word. So it's not quite as narrow as what you think of as music classes in high school. It would at least include the your English classes, uh, your history classes, your social studies classes, as your religious classes, if you went to a religious school, your catechism classes, if you went to Catholic school, um, as well as dance class and music class. Okay, so that, that's the Greek education. It would traditionally involve religious education, which was assumed to be the source of wisdom, and which included an exposure to the central poets of ancient Greek culture, Homer and Hesiod. This allows in the freedom to construct the city as he would prefer, allows Plato the freedom to undertake an extensive critique of traditional Greek poetry, both in its content and its style. So he uses the excuse of having to describe how are we going to educate these guardians, which is very important because remember the, the, the whole idea here is that it's this education that's going to prevent them from turning on us and becoming a kind of, uh, you know, police state force, like the Gestapo in Nazi Germany, oppressing the people. They need to be educated in the right way. So there's there's high stakes. And it's, in, it's against that background, in that context, that Plato shows this willingness to disagree and sharply criticize the portrayal of the gods in, in Homer and Hesiod. He shows a, a debt here clearly to uh, Xenophanes and many of the pre-Socratics who had laid the groundwork for this, which is a um, activity that, that's regarded potentially as impious. But Plato regards the way that the, the poets are portraying the gods as actually impious. Portraying the gods behaving badly is regarded by Plato as, as scandalous. The 267 in the bottom right hand corner, he says, first, the greatest falsehood about the greatest things has no good features. I mean, Hesiod telling us about how Uranus behaved and how Cronus punished him for it and how he in turn was punished by his own son. The, I mean, one thing one needs to um, appreciate here is that for the Greeks, the sort of the worst thing that you could do would be to dis show disrespect to your father, for example, by striking your father. And so you have these stories in Hesiod about, as described in the footnote here, about one god uh, castrating his own father, which clearly has, um, you know, from our perspective, we think, well, this clearly has a kind of symbolic allegorical meaning given what these gods represented in terms of natural forces and so on. But Plato says so this, is, this is horribly scandalous behavior. A god who is supposed to be what you're supposed to look up to and emulate and worship, uh, or at least offer sacrifices to behaving in a way that would be regarded if human beings did it as the most hor horrible and horrifying thing that one could do. That's the idea. But even if these stories were true, they should be passed over in silence and not told so casually to the foolish and the young. He's worried about corrupting the minds of the youth with these stories. And if for some reason they should be told, only a very few people should hear them. Some reformers proposed allegorical readings of these embarrassing stories, and the same happened later with the Jews of the Hellenistic period, and later the Christians, looking back at the Old Testament in particular, which has the advantage of allowing these stories to be true. So 
for example, embarrassing stories in the Old Testament of the Torah about the um, the cleansing of the Canaanites from the land and so on are read uh, by the church fathers and thereafter often as allegorical tales about expunging sin from the soul or something like that, not to be taken literally. However, Plato recognizes an obvious flaw with this as it pertains to education, as he says um, on 268, about three quarters of the way down on the left-hand column, for the young cannot distinguish what is allegorical from what is not. And the beliefs they absorb at that age are difficult to erase and tend to become unalterable. The young aren't sophisticated enough to understand a story allegorically, and what they are, are taught at that age tends to stick with them. And they can't, later on, at a later age, they, they can't really fully see it as allegorical. And you can see this now. Think about fundamentalist uh, evangelical Christians who are taught these stories of the, you know, the, the cleansing of the land of Canaan, at a young age, they, they take it literally. And then when they grow, later on when they grow up, they, they resist the idea that this is to be read allegorically. And they think it has to be read literally, read literally, because that's like really the only way that it seems to make sense to them. Why? Because they, they absorb the literal reading at a very young age when they didn't have the mental capacity to read it allegorically or any other way but literally. And that sticks with them. That's, that's precisely what Plato is worried about here. Now, Socrates suggests that it's axiomatic that a god is always good and always does good. A god is always good. That's almost um, a tautology, it seems, he suggests. And the god is as being always good, the god always does good. Hence, if a god is portrayed as doing something bad in a story, that is ipso facto a reason for concluding that the story is false. How do you know that it's false? How do you know, I mean, take it into our cultural context, how do you know that God didn't actually literally um, order a flood that drowned everyone on the, the planet Earth, including little babies? Because God is good and God wouldn't do that. That's my argument. That's how I know. That's, that's basically the way Plato's thinking here. Of course, with the Greek gods, though, not with Yahweh or the, the Christian Hebrew God the Hebrew Christian, I suppose I should say, in justice. This is a very moralistic interpretation of the gods, obviously. The gods are necessarily moral. And that leads Socrates to propose three rules that should govern the writing of poetry. And we might think of this as part of a censorship code. So the three rules, first is on uh, 269 and the right towards the top, where he says, the gods are not the cause of all things, but only good ones. That's, that's the first rule. So these are like censorship rules that are going to, this is the censorship code, like they used to have the Hollywood code and so on. The comics code that, you know, for Marvel Comics, DC Comics. These are some of the rules. The first rule is the gods are not the cause of all things, but only good things. The gods can only be portrayed in poetry in our fiction as causing good things, not bad things. So we censor, we take, take out anything that is not portraying the gods as causing good things. Second, it's impossible for a god to want to alter himself. If you're at all familiar with Greco-Roman mythology, you know, of course, all these stories about the gods changing form and you know Zeus changing himself into a bird and sleeping with a woman or that kind of thing. But um, Socrates argues that actually the idea that the god would want to change their, his form, which is perfect after all, the god's natural form is, is a perfect form, to want to alter himself and change his form is, is for him to want to become less perfect. And that doesn't make any sense. So it's impossible for a god to want to alter himself. That's the second. And the third is that the gods never lie. They never deceive, they never... Um, use stratagems. I realize now that with the first one, I might have inflected it, kind of the, give, give the wrong spin on it. The first one, the idea that the gods are the cause, not of all things, but of only good ones, is really kind of a, a, an issue about the problem of evil. So if um, gods uh, are viewed as being the cause of, let's say, your child getting bone cancer, 
that would be the kind of thing that, that Plato would regard as being um, unacceptable, an unacceptable belief. God didn't cause that. God only causes good things. That's, that's the idea. You don't blame the gods for bad things that happen to people. Uh, that's that's the sense of the, the the first one. So the second, the, the gods never lie or deceive, is kind of would kind of be a subset of of that general point. But it um, it focuses more on this idea of the gods representing themselves in a kind of straightforward way that isn't going to use these these masks that the poets often attributed to the gods. Okay, so those are the the three rules. We'll continue with this discussion of the critique of the poets in the next video.